coming in here for our event tonight. Um, my name is Michaela Moros, and I'm Assistant Professor in Buddhist Studies here at Stanford University. And on behalf of the whole Center for Buddhist Studies, I would like to welcome you all to this event, which is part of the TT and W. Chao Distinguished Buddhist Practitioner Lecture Series. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, a few words for the format are in order. This Zoom event will be recorded. And first we will have a conversation and then we will open up for Q&A, which I will then moderate. For this, you can either use the Zoom function to raise your hand and then I will call you and then you can state your question in person. Or you can also type in your question in the chat function and then I will read your question. So it is a great pleasure today to welcome Reverend Zenju Ursuline Manuel. She's a Soto priest in the Shunryu Suzuki Yoshi lineage to the San Francisco Zen Center. She's also poet, author, artist, and medicine woman of the drum. Some of her inspiring books include The Deepest Peace, Contemplation from a Season of Stillness, and Sanctuary, a Meditation from Home, Homelessness and Belonging, and The Weight of Tenderness, Awakening to Ways, Sexuality and Gender. She was raised in the Church of Christ and has been influenced also by many other religions, including Nichiren Buddhism and Native American and African indigenous traditions. She also holds a PhD and worked for decades as a social science researcher and for nonprofit organizations. Today, we will mainly be touching on topics she explores in her forthcoming book, The Shamanic Bones of Zen, Revealing the Ancestral Spirit of the Mystical Heart of a Sacred Tradition. And I was very excited to read this book. And because as many probably of you know, I work myself on rituals in the Japanese Soto Zen tradition. And it was a very welcome addition to, I think, the Zen scholarship, especially on American Zen. And Zenju, I was very, yeah, as I said, inspired by your book, especially because in American Zen, there is not so much discussion about rituals. And a lot of times I feel in Zen communities, people kind of disregard or overlook rituals. And we also see this tendency in a lot of publications on Western Zen. And I'm really curious if you could tell us a little bit more about why you had the idea to write a book on Zen rituals and ceremonies. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation um, to be here and thank all of you for joining. And uh, I hope that uh, this talk will be engaging for you and um, give some, uh, oh, hi, Paula. So <laughs> I have to say Paula Arai, Arai is here and she did the, uh, the forward to the book. It's a beautiful forward. And so uh, it's been very supportive of the work. And um, so, and there's a lot of others here that uh, are familiar names. And then some of my students are here as well. Some of the people in my Sangha. I always like to call them aspirants, really. I think they're more of that than they are my students. Something that I own, I don't. Um, I am here in New Mexico and, um, you know, uh, the Tiwa land and uh, many uh, tribes, Aztec tribes are here, um, Lakota and Dene and many, many tribes, which is what I love about New Mexico. There's always a ceremony going on somewhere here because there's so many ceremonial uh, tribes and uh, communities and pueblos too there's like 19 pueblos so i'm excited to to be here i i'm from i'm a native of california and i have been coming to new mexico for uh at least 20 years um well let's say 17 because then i kind of skipped a few <laughs> And it, it was right alongside my practice of Zen, Soto Zen. And I think because of having um, these indigenous earth-based ceremonial practices in my life, as I walked uh, the, the path of Zen, I could recognize the rituals and ceremonies of Zen as very important. And, um, and they also, not from my mind, but from my body. Um, I find that uh, ritual um, and ceremony 
is a profound way to transform one's life and to be awakened without hearing anyone else's voice. Um, you know, so a lot of times we feel we need to be guided to enlightenment uh, or to Buddhahood or um, any of these things of, of exaltion that seem like uh, to be exalted in some way. I found in my own experience that uh, just doing the ritual and the ceremony provided the, the space and, and created the illumination needed and uh, also mimicked the vastness of life. And so I would hear many people come, you know, they would come to Zen Center, they'd be new, or friends would come, they would be new, or people would come to study with me, and, and they would be totally confused by what is going on here. Uh, what is this Zen? And um, they're even confused sometimes by me. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very much often confused as an insight meditation teacher. And that's because the majority of uh, BIPOC teachers are from that tradition. And so they, they it, I just automatically, <laughs> even when my robes are on, <laughs> they assume I, I, they don't know where I'm from or what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> Sometimes uh, these are folks who don't understand the many traditions of Zen. They think there uh, or of Buddhism. They don't understand there's as many traditions in Buddhism as there are in any other uh, religion, Islam, Christianity, or any other religion. There's so many different kinds of uh, traditions in Buddhism. So anyway, I felt it was important to write the book, The Shamanic Bones of Zen not from a scholarly perspective, although I do include the scholars uh, and honor them in, in the study, but I wanted to also talk about the experience, uh, not only in Zen, but in Buddhism, and that many people have practiced for many years and begin to have experiences within them, but no one to talk to about or nothing to, to um, even guide around what, what experiences they might have that may be, quote unquote, of a shamanic nature. Now, in the book, I'm not forcing a, a, an overlay or trying to convince everyone that Buddhism, that our Zen is shamanic, necessarily. Although I experienced it as such, being one who went into and practiced other shamanic experiences. I myself speak about, in the book, having an opening in which uh, an actual oracle came to me after after practicing for seven years and practicing very hard and intensely in chanting for seven years. So um, <clears throat> I thought it's important to talk about that there's another aspect of Buddhism and especially Zen that is not often talked about. <laughs> it's kind of underground. Um, there are books, there are conferences. I know this is going on, so I don't think I'm the only one. And I've stepped out, you know, into the off the cliff by myself. I, <laughs> I think I'm joined somewhere around there in this work, in this exploration. Um, but it was important to me that as a Zen priest, to help people understand the calling and to help people understand that what is actually going on in Zen are rituals and ceremony. And if they enter into that gateway of Zen, they're entering into a ritual or ceremony. Whereas mostly, especially in the secular world, meditation is just sitting and being calm and being quiet and achieving something. Sometimes I, I hear there's some achieving, which is not the case and Zen, and then so why would you go? Why, why bother if you're not gonna achieve anything? And that is the, you know, uh, why a lot of people do add on, you will achieve this, you know, maybe in a retreat or something like that. And in my retreats, I try to stay away from it. So often people come to the retreat and they'll say, I don't know why I signed up for this retreat because they don't know what they're gonna get out of it and neither do I. Like in this moment, I have no idea. Um, what is going to come of our time together. But I do have a groundedness in, in my own uh, body that came from Zen practice. And I, I'm relying on that, not my knowledge. I'm relying on the, this practice of, of sitting Zazen 
and doing ritual, and I consider Zazen a ritual, the main ritual, which is talked about in the book, is like the biggest section of the book is about Zazen. And I, um, I, I, I'm sitting here and speaking with you from that place, you know, and from that, the stillness that it provided me so that I could see. So the point was not to just be still, but then I can't tell you what else is to happen, right? Because then you'll look for it. If I say you're to be enlightened or, you know, you'll become like, you know, I don't know, Dalai Lama <laughs> or Thich Nhat Hanh or something. I don't know, you know, what it will come of you. Only you'll know. And when you walk into the ceremony and you do ceremony, I had originally, I had originally practiced in Nishran for 15 years, Soka Gakkai International, and there's just a lot of chanting a lot of chanting. And so I really enjoyed that. I did. I said, wow, this is just fantastic. And so when I went to Zen, they were, they were chanting. And I said, wow, there's more chanting. And I really wasn't sure what that was about. And, um, but later when I reflected back, um, I began to notice that the chanting, the bowing, uh, offering incense were all uh, the acts of awakening that they were the actual acts of awakening. And um, I, I like to tell this one story where, um, that I heard once that there was a person who would, um, you know, give the incense to the teacher, that's called the Jiko. And they would give the incense to the teacher. And every time this Jiko would give incense to the teachers, uh, they would cry, the teacher, no matter who the teacher was. And I understood it. I understood what was happening there, not necessarily them personally, but in that story, I, I felt the, that those tears and that, um, that sensation of being, um, my life is wide as an ocean or a meadow, but also understanding the lived experience within oppression and that that was like a, like a stone in the water. I was just telling my students that, uh, yesterday like a stone in the water and so um i like that story about the person you know the way they gave the incense to the teacher and the teachers would cry didn't matter which teacher it was they would cry and it was almost reminded me like every time i would hear the bell not in the beginning when i first started but in the, after a while i would hear the bell and i would cry just from hearing the bell and um that is the awakening happening to me through the body and the release of, uh, of the confines and what is imposed upon one's life in the world just from the sound of the bell. So it was really important um, for me to write about this. So that's what the shamanic bones is. You know, really just a little bit to um, give back and then I'd like you to ask me another question. Uh, or we can engage on that yeah. one. But um, I think it was important to me that people understood Zen because they, it's interesting how many people say they know Zen and they don't. And they, and they talk about it uh, in a way as if they do, as if they, you know, maybe they've been there for a couple of days or weeks, but a very few, um, or they were there for 30 years, but never experienced the the rituals and the chanting you know as awakening and for whatever reason i think there's a lot of reasons for that yeah so anyway yeah i think it's fascinating to hear you speak about that also you mentioned like the stillness in the meditation and in the zazen or the seated meditation mm -hmm. but also then the like the bowing the offering of incense as like acts how did you transfer over this kind of the stillness into these movements. Could you also talk a little bit that and how, because Zazen is a very still. Very aspect. still. But then we have the movements, the bowing, yeah. the chanting too. I mean, the chanting is maybe even the opposite of the stillness, if you think yeah. about the sounds. It, yeah, it is the stillness though, when you're standing, you know, together. You're in, it is, there's, 
And when you're walking meditation, there's stillness in that too. So you're learning to, in the bowing, learning to uh, move with that stillness right there in the moment. You know, you're, you, you sit, you walk, you chant, you sit, almost in that order, walk and chant. So you're using that zazen in the moment. Other way zazen is used is in calligraphy. You can use it in, you know, what you do in art or um, in life, here in poetry. There's a lot of Zen poetry, right? And that comes from the, the, the rituals and ceremonies, even the ones who, the Zen um, masters who didn't go into monastery life, they were still out being still in the forest in the way that uh, Buddha was. Um, I, I feel that um, the practice of stillness cannot be, um, you can't force yourself into it. I think many people want to force themselves into that stillness. So when you began um, still, you know, the practice of stillness and zazen, it takes a little while. It takes some time for your uh, body to understand you're not there to play with your mind. We're not playing right now today. We're not engaging and it'll still do its thing. But you know, you're learning, you're teaching the body um, to, to be still despite the movement of the mind, even if your body might move in the beginning, you know. And then after a while, I kind of tell people that to allow, um, instead of meditating, I tell people, you know, you can stop meditating now. Uh, instead of meditating, allow meditation to come to you. Allow stillness to come to you, allow calm to come to you. This was the practice to me uh, in Zen, practice in practicing with Zazen over the years. So like I said, I did come from 15 years of Nishan, which I felt provided the, the needed concentration, you know, a concentration practice before sitting Zazen. So I feel like I kind of got a, a, a little bit more than some people who just come to Zazen and just sit. So I was quite disciplined in sitting for hours and hours and hours, uh, you know, chanting, but still uh, taking that chanting in um, as, as a path of liberating myself from um, or using my life to liberate myself from uh, engaging in the way that causes suffering. You know, so there's, there is suffering, right? We know this, but um, you know, the engagement of that, and I call it suffering, the suffering uh, doesn't, you know, have to happen. Some people say suffering doesn't have to happen, but I think the suffering, the suffering doesn't have to happen. We don't have to suffer suffering. We can um, en engage it in different ways, and was, which is what I did, you know, in Zazen. It wasn't, um, you know, it was painful. Um, there were difficult times uh, with, with Sangha, uh, difficult times and understanding, difficult times and standing out, you know, feeling like I'm making a mistake or something like that or not doing it right. Um, the, that's, that's quite normal. These are things that were in my mind that I had in my mind probably ever since I was five years old and went to school, you know, who knows, or when my mother told me that wasn't right. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's so old and it just kind of traveled with me into my uh, practices. So no matter where I was, even if I practiced any native or uh, African uh, ritual or ceremony, there still was this having to do it and um, have it become part of my body, my movement, even though I might not feel it's quite right, because that's the mind saying, that's not right. Even though my body's like, I'm trying to get this. If you could just be patient, I can get, I will get this, you know, I will not get it. So it looks good. Like, oh, I sit real well. I bow real well. I walk real well. I, whatever the things you're doing there. Um, it's not the point. That's why it's okay. If there's a mistake, it's okay. If you're chanting and there's a, there's a mistake, but as you, as you grow, you become more attentive to, uh, the chant, more attentive to the bow. Um, more attentive to how you move. You know, a lot of people move very rigidly sometimes, and and I see them, and I just want to like tap them on the back, which 
you know, they do have the Kyle Saka, but if we don't have them, you know, to, to, to release, you know, that energy in their body and that we're not being, it's not a militarized movement, but rather a dance. And when you learn how to dance in Zen, oh my God, you know, it's the same thing when you learn how to dance and at Sundance, Native American Sundance, it's a lot of pain, it hurts. And then it, but it also um, takes you out of your usual kind of comfort zone you create, your manufacturing of a practice. You know, well, I'm only gonna do this much as in and not that much. You know, that kind of thing that we come in and do. And to me, you're, you're coming in and, t and cutting off the ceremony. I could see a lot of people not liking the chanting. Um, I might have liked it because I like to sing anyway. And I used to sing in church, you know, I used to sing in a group, um, in an ensemble. So we sang a lot and I like to sing. I like music. I, and so, um, I still could hear the same music I sung in church when Zen people chanted, the same thing happened to me. You know, when I heard the chants, I still had a certain amount of uh, body reaction response to the chanting as I did when I was in church. And that's when I knew where I was, was a, it was a place for me to be and to stay, despite all the craziness that was going on around me, which I think is the same craziness that's in the world. So it didn't make really a difference in that sense, whether I was gonna survive it or not um, would be interesting. So for everyone's knowledge, I didn't really start writing um, books around the Dharma until I was um, maybe um, 30 years into the practice, almost. That includes Nishra. So um, all of them, the way a tenderness about race did not come out when I walked in and looked around. I, it came out after 17 years after practicing because I wanted whatever voice I, I shared with the world that would be shared from the seat of Zazen and only from that. Although I can, I, you know, I have a PhD, I can be very scholarly, very political, very intellectual. Um, and I didn't come to be all of that. I was already that when I walked in. I had my PhD when I walked in. So it's no need to get a PhD in Zen. <laughs> yeah. It was just about doing, doing my life and engaging those ceremonies and seeing how they Im impacted me. And I, and I want to honor my teacher, Zenke um, Blanche Hartman, who is now gone. Um, uh, Seeds for a Boundless Life is her book that I, a collection of her Dharma talks that I did for her, which is the old fashioned way of getting a book. You don't write your own book. You, the students, the aspirants write the book for you. But that's kind of gone somewhere <laughs> into, into the past. But, you know, she uh, transmitted the joy of, of Zen to me. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't realize it till I found myself being so happy for a ceremony coming up. I was like, okay, <laughs> she has influenced me. So I don't know. Hope that answers some of your questions. Yes. Did she teach you a lot of these ceremonies or the value of ceremonies? How was it for you to learn or to appreciate like the transformative yes. power of ritual mm -hmm. and of ceremony? I think just watching her, you know, she, she, she wasn't um, one of these teachers who pontificated or, you know, who, you know, going to preach to you or guide you in that way. I mean, she never even, she only guided when you came and you've already done the thing. <laughs> you're, already, <laughs> you're already in trouble rather than her trying to prevent us from doing things. She was always waits for us to come on our knees and uh, say, oh my goodness, I have done this thing. I just watched her. It, she was a perfect uh, model to me of, of Zen practice. Now she's not, she was not at all a perfect person. Nope, nope, not a perfect person. Neither was I. Um, so how do two imperfect people stand together in this world? How do we do that? I think we do that through, you know, the rituals and through, you know, the ceremonies. I think that's why they're finding scientifically um, that meditation helps people 
um, you know, mental um, wellness, helps create mental wellness. And I think that's because um, meditation has a shamanic aspect to it. So it's very different than therapy or um, something, a medicine that you might receive. So I think that we're talking about it as if it's science alone, but it's actually spirit to me. So I'm speaking on the spirit side of things as opposed to the science side. And the science side is kind of trying to find the facts to prove the spirit side. And I understand that, that idea, but it's not where I live because I already been revealed, <laughs> you know, through um, these ancestral practices that it's the wisdom is there and the in these chants and this bowing and this way of doing things. We even have orioki, which is a ceremonial eating, that these are specifically designed to um, to bring that wisdom and awakening to you. You know, even though you're troubled, you you know, your little troubled mind, I can't do this, is happening. You know, which happens anyway, right? <laughs> it's happening anyway. It, it's just looming in front of you when you're doing these rituals and ceremonies that to me that mimic life standing walking sitting lying down eating sleeping is working it's all it's all life that's going on there you know and uh, but in a ritual you know, way yeah you talked all you we haven't talked so much about chanting yet i mean you hinted at that and you talked about that you have a very strong musical background I mean you play the drums as well and you sing mm -hmm. do you think that influenced how you approach chanting in the Zen tradition I think so yes <laughs> I'm pretty sure it did because I already knew the power of the drum and I think a lot of people say well there's no drum in, in Zen and there is you know there's a taiko drum and the makubyo and I loved them both when I heard them. And the bell is a drum, it's just metal. And so I, I you know, it's just right for me. All the things were there, all the instruments, and then the voice. Oh my God, what a beautiful thing to bring together of people from everywhere. You don't know their name, you don't know their background, you know. So sometimes the trouble comes in when we stop singing, right? We start talking <laughs> to each other and it's like, whoa, you know, what is that you said? <laughs> and those kinds of things, um, you know, uh, eventually over time uh, for you, if you're on the outside, it might not change because people are coming from different places over and over and over and over. But for you, how, for me, how I began to see myself responding differently and engaging differently. It verbally and in action, you know, because of the rituals and ceremonies because of Zazen. So I don't mean now I became much more quieter because that's what people think are more Buddhist like. Um, I and then act Buddhistic or whatever is that a word? You know, I didn't do those kinds of things. I though I think something changed to me over time, but not um, you know not in a way where I wasn't still a human being, you know? So the human being remains. And, um, but the actions of the human being can be transformed. And um, so chanting, um, it, it's, I, I love to chant and I love to sing. If you ask me to sing a Lakota song, I could sing that. And if you ask me to chant, I would chant that in just as much uh, verver energy and passion as I would um, anything because I recognize these ancient songs. I recognize them from someplace way, way beyond. We were, we were even thinking probably, or even were thought of were ever coming to this world. So it's, it's so old. And I feel I can um, access that ancientness through, through the songs of any practice. You know, it, it doesn't matter if I hear an Islamic call, I have chills, or if I hear some different kinds of Christian songs, or, you know, um, doesn't matter if it has an element of the ancient, of the ancestral in it, I'm going to feel it. I know this about myself. So I don't think everyone necessarily has that. 
you know, um, like you said, maybe because I am a drummer, but I can hear when I drum, I also was very passionate about that and how I could hear and see the people of the drum I was using. So I, I drum Congolese and I have Congolese drums that are tall that, you know, I had to get one that could fit me because I'm short, you know, because you stand up to these Congolese drums are tall and not like gym bass down low. Um, I played the, um, I won't say play, I would say invited and engaged the uh, round drum, the Lakota round drum, hand drum and the big ceremony a drum by leading songs and drum in drumming. And I think I'm just uh, picking up on the heartbeat of, uh, you know, all of the shamanic bones of all the practices. <laughs> so, um, so I, I do talk about the bones, what those bones are, you know, somewhat more uh, specifically in the book. And I'm using some of the um, different already written about by many scholars. Um, and the point is, we have not been transmitted the entire practice that we've only had. I always tell people like a fingernail worth of the practice. We don't have it. Uh, for many reasons, the whole practice has not been transmitted in. So yeah, the chanting is um, exciting to me. And this is why I was uh, very interested in speaking with you, Michaela, because of your uh, research on uh, Koshiki. That, that practice has not been transmitted, transmitted to Western Soto Zen. Some of it, you can, you know, feel it, some of that in the chanting. And I can understand more of how, how the chanting was, is being refined and has been refined over time. But I think there's still more, more to go. And, um, and it relies on um, folks staying long enough in, in, in the practice and opening to the uh the element of ritual and ceremony and not coming to get something out of buddhism to be more calm to be more loving to be to be to be to be and to um, let that part go and trust that if you do the practice you know you do the sitting all of that is is um, promised to you and and just not by anybody but just by your sure effort you know in practice so you know, I can't wait till you yeah. share some of that with us. Yeah, yeah um, it's very um, interesting that it's really like the transmission of ritual practices has been so spotty in many ways yeah. from Japan to the West. Mm -hmm. And these koshiki really have not been transmitted. I think in Italy, they, some nuns wanted to perform one of the koshiki for Ananda, but I'm not sure if they have actually done that so far, but mm -hmm. talking yeah. about that. Yeah. And it's a very different chanting because now, like what the Zen centers usually do, we have the the com like a heart sutra, other texts, or the irony of the compassion, and in very constant beat with, yeah, no melodies basically in a like monotone chanting in a way, which is also very like putting on almost in a trance and in a different stage, but it does not have this melodic character what the Koshki rituals still have. Yeah, and it's, yeah. I think it's, well, it's, it's meant to be that way, just like a, a Gregorian chant, you know, it's not sung the same way you would do um, R&B, you know? So, you know, <laughs> yeah. each, each, each kind of music, each, each kind of chanting, has a purpose is raising something within uh, us collectively and individually and so the chants are to espouse you know and to bring in compassion in a way that we can't bring to ourselves so we all think we bring in compassion but we're not sure all the time and we're we have some you know there's well, how many people here that there's probably 50 definitions of compassion and 50 50 ways of being compassionate and we would all be surprised about what that is. And we would disagree. We probably would argue about it, you know, have a debate about that because the compassion that is being offered, say in the Heart Sutra, is being offered in the Heart Sutra. So chant it, <laughs> <laughs> you chant the Heart Sutra, 
or the compassion in which Buddha was leaving and laying down in, in his teachings. And the Heart Sutra was the first one that um, like blew me out the first time I heard it. I was like, I don't know, I just felt completely free. After I heard that chant, I was, I don't know what happened. I ran to get a copy and they did not give me one. They said, you just keep chanting, just keep chanting. And, but it's important to, what it did was touch, you know, I can reflect back. It touched my heart in that place where I began to have tears, you know, during that place that needed to be touched. And in the tears is the compassion. It's not out there. It's not with you. It's not even with me completely, because when we're in that state, we're not we we're not in control really most of the time. We don't sit down and go, I'm gonna really give a good cry. Most of us, we're really kind of feeling something that's happening. So I I feel like the chanting and the zazen is to help create a meditative state of consciousness in which you can let go of all the things that you think of yourself to be, or where you live, and how you're doing things. That's very difficult for people to do. It's like, oh no, I'm not gonna let go of who I am. And that's okay too. You can hold on to it. And still, if you keep doing these ceremonies and rituals, it will break. And it broke for me, you know, it did break. You know, there was an evolution, you know, that occurred in me. And so my identity became very evolved <laughs> and it still is evolved. Yet there's, I can name it. I name, may name it in the same way other people do but it's an evolution in it. It's not the same, yeah. you know, and I, uh, it's hard to explain that. I, I tried to explain that in the way of tenderness, but it was, you know, difficult. I think, um, I think people who come into Buddhism, uh, no matter what it is, which tradition, I think will get in touch with, um, their ancestral root, not just themselves, but I'm talking about, the ancestral root of human beings, live, living beings, the mountain, the earth, the moon, all of it, you get in touch with that, you know? And um, I think that that's the power in it for me, you know, that it, there, you, you just get in touch with it. The moment you bow down and touch your forehead to the ground is to, recognize yourself as the earth and also to recognize that the earth itself relatively gave you all that you have and all that you're living with you it was already here when you came all the medicine all the everything was here and everything when you leave will be left <laughs> you know so it's, it's not you you know even the things you do um, 10 million other people are doing the same thing you're doing Someone's talking right now while I'm talking somewhere. So it's all going on at the same time somewhere. Yeah. And I think that ceremony and rituals show you that when you're doing things together and moving together. Yeah, you mentioned ancestors right now and we talked about chanting and before you asked me via email and we chatted about that, that I would, that you would like me to share some of the Koshki songs or videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, maybe that might be a good point to share. Yeah, which it's a good time to share. And I'm wondering, could you um, put the, that word in the uh, chat so people yeah, can know so what we're right. talking about? So they may be wanting to look that up. This is the type of chanting in Soto Zen that um, beautifully demonstrates some of what I'm talking about. Now, not all of the, the things you'll see is transmitted into Western American Zen but I'd like to see these things become more and more. And I, and I know there's already a lot to do because I, you know, I have been yeah. there at the Zen <laughs> yes, Center. So we don't have a lot of time, you know. But. There's so much that has not been transmitted. And I thought it might be also a good point because you talked about ancestors. So I will show two, two videos with okay. excerpts from this Koshki. And that's a Koshki performed for Keizam, the founder of Soji, one of the two great ancestors in the Japanese Soto tradition. So he's also one of the ancestors venerated in the Soto Zen tradition. And so it's a remembrance ritual for him performed every year. And it's a very elaborate ritual. And I play two pieces, so we get an idea of the differences between them. The first one 
is the first piece of the ritual and it's a purification of the room. And that's where we start. It's called um, verse of the scattering flowers. Yes, we are in the right one. Sorry about that. So now we have the first one. What's the first one I wanted to share? So that's how the ritual starts. And then I wanted to play another piece, which is very different in terms of musical style. And it's the song of the priest staff, where the monks praise the priest staff, which they hold in their hands and offer it to the sweet treasures, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. No. Somehow we have to stop sharing. I need to close my quick time first with the old one before going to the okay. new one. Otherwise it doesn't work here. Okay. Now, let's see, does it work? It, can you see it now? Yes. So, great. gave you a good idea about the music in Japanese Soto Zen, which mm -hmm. is quite different, but these videos really touch on a lot of aspects you covered in your book, Zenju, when you talk yeah. Yeah, about the section about the purification of the room, you talked a lot about how a shaman prepares in all traditions, a ritual space and the purification, and also in the Zen tradition, how you bow in front of your cushion and prepare it and then start sitting. So in order to purify the space. And here we saw in the first one, exactly the same thing. Basically it's first piece of the ritual and the space is purified. So the incense that's carried around the room and the water sprinkled really to purify and the flowers are scattered to attract all the Bodhisattvas ancestors to come to the ritual space down. Exactly. Yeah. 
Exactly. And to be held by the ancestors, not by ourselves, we know how to do this, you know, but really to be held by those who brought the practice to today um, from who knows when. And, and the purification is really important. I talk about that in the book, and that happens a lot in Zen. And I remember um, being charged to ring the bell in a Zendo. And, I, you know, you have to go to all the corners. And I said, that's exactly what you do in African <laughs> tradition is clear the corners, you know, and you clear the room. Uh, Sundance, they clear with um, uh, cedar smoke. You know, water is used in many rituals. So fire, water, smoke, all of these elements are, are um, basic, basic shamanic practice. So I, I did you notice the um, staff? Whose staff was that? What staff did that come from? Whose staff is that? I'm not going to answer. Who knows? That staff is particular, not just any staff. Jizo. That's Jizo's staff, Jizo Bodhisattva. He carried that staff. And, 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 and when he, it's to help the, the animal scatter and everybody, and then it's for protection. Again, preparing, you know, making the noise for those so we don't walk on the, you know, the animals that are crawling. And if, a, you know, the bird, this was all like a lot done outside. The birds, can, you know, just these kinds of things. And so that was Jizo Bodhisattva. If you ever see that, he has that staff and the staff is very important so you know you it 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 leads the person with the staff is leading the ceremony which is the same thing that happens in in the ceremonies i've been in in the native american and african ceremonies and um so i just kind of bring out the elements that i feel that i knew was happening in my zen practice but i wasn't sure but it was interesting when I went to research, it was exactly what I thought. And I was shocked. That's like, well, why didn't they tell us this? And I could understand why it could get very confusing, easily, very confusing to people if they took, you know, uh, this practice in a shamanic way, not understanding what that is, you know, or being afraid of it or um, whatever, you know, might happen. I can understand, I understand the caution. <clears throat> I understand why only so much, you know, was um, being given, you know, to us and so much not, you know. Um, I think we're needing to um, mute Jamie again. Can you mute him? Um, Irene, are you still here? I think I haven't For some reason him. I can't. Oh, there you are. Did I mute him? Okay. It's, yeah, you mute it. Yeah. yeah coughing there. So um, anyway, yeah, I do talk about the um, why the layout, you know, in the Zen Center, and these kinds of things. I went to insight meditation in the beginning when I was, I didn't know I was moving from Nishan. I had no idea I was. So I didn't just say I'm moving from Nishan. That's not how it happened. Mm -hmm. I just found myself at another retreat. And then I noticed I went to insight and um, there was no chanting and I wasn't used to that and it, I didn't see any rituals and ceremonies and I knew that that was what helped me transform uh, my life and I needed something uh, I needed a a type of um, spiritual community in which th these rituals and ceremonies were going on every day so that I could come any day I wanted now the, I don't know of anything else that you can do every day if you know if something call me up i might be interested but <laughs> most places don't have everyday ritual and ceremony most traditions don't and i think that that was really important to me that it that it was every day um or, or quite often you know like i would in nishran i would be with my sangha like two three four times a week you know chanting and if, if even if we weren't just all together Someone may come to your house and you can just on the moment get into that um, chanting. And so now in terms of the actual teachings of all the traditions, they vary and they're different and people interpret them very differently maybe than what I have. People will look at this book and go, no, this is not it. <laughs> maybe the shamanic bones of Zen. So far I have not had that and I've talked to pioneer teachers before this book was published. So I, I 
I don't feel again that I'm out here alone making up things. I think it it actually is something that is there, but not, I guess, highlighted or spot or spotlighted. But I just can feel myself in the in the video. You know, I was settled immediately as soon as the bell rang. I that sound. You know, I you know. Maybe it's behavior modification, but it's a good behavior. Yeah, I don't know. I like when <laughs> I, work, I went there to do my future. So I did long time over six years, actually more than that, field work in Japan. But mm -hmm. once I went with a friend of mine, a scholar who was on working on textual studies more, mm -hmm. and we went to this one ritual. And the moment the drum starts, it just takes you in. And he also said, You cannot resist. It just the drum really just takes you into the ritual and you enter a different world through the sounds and you could just have to give in or you have to kind of maybe mentally say i don't want but it just takes yeah. you in. you can fight it if you want to uh, yeah and we don't have a um, master taiko um drum masters in in zen at least i haven't seen really any in in the um western world and that drum is very important so um, I know when I was at Tassajara, because I was a drummer, they asked me to help the people get a, 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 a rhythm that worked, you know, for the uh, roll down. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not a master <laughs> taiko drummer, but I knew that I could feel into it and help a little bit. Um, and then at City Center one time, some nuns came from, um, uh, were they from Korea? I think they were from Korea. Korea. Maybe? Huh? Nagoya? Maybe, yeah, maybe. They came and it, it was a whole, they never travel alone. They're not like Westerners. We go off on our own. <laughs> they travel with their sangha, which is so beautiful. And so they were, um, it was my morning to be doshi and, and they were going to chant um, the Makahanya Haramita, the, the Heart Sutra. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be very interesting. It'll be very beautiful, you know, because you know, the way they chant is very different. And, but I was going to have to move to the altar and, and offer incense and then move, make a move again and come back. And I had to do this not knowing what they were chanting, right? Because it's a different, different language and they're chanting and everybody's there and the whole assembly at six o'clock in the morning, we're half asleep. And so I just got, I came in and everything is pomp and circumstance, which I like. So anyway it you know you come from upstairs with the han and the bell and you know you're walking and finally you make it to the buddha hall where you're going to make offer the incense so you don't just offer the incense it almost takes 10 minutes to offer incense you know with all the bowing the releasing of your bowing cloth all of this to keep you right there because you if you're not right there you won't be able to unrelease that bowing cloth you will go the wrong way and the incense will not be offered you know, so if you're not there. So anyway, they started drumming to the taiko drum, boom, boom, they put it in the Buddha hall. It was beautiful. You know, it's like the rhythm we don't know yet. It wasn't transmitted. And we chant this chant all the time. And they're doing this rhythm, boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, oh my God, I felt like I was, you know, walking in the sky on the clouds or something. And I said, oh, you better pay attention because you're going to have to make a move <laughs> eventually. <laughs> And just because it, the the drum and the spirit of the Heart Sutra and the you know was in my heart already, I was able to make the move at the right time, and uh, and and everybody was surprised. I did the whole thing in Korean, and I never had done that before. That's a connection to the practice. I no one had to teach me when to move, you know, teach me the Korean word so I knew when to move. I just did it all from the feeling of it. And the drumming was just going on. And I just, I'll never forget it. It was such a gift and uh, they were such a gift. And, you know, we became good friends <laughs> a lot. You know, they're running me around, following me around, Zinju, Zinju, Zinju. It's like, I gotta work, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we have work to do here, but it was so much fun. You know, so, yeah. so powerful to really get to, to do that in real time in an ancient way. And, you know, they were all women, all women from uh, Korea, Korea, 
I, I, that name sounds right, Mikhail. I think that. No, actually, it was a different. I thought I didn't oh, okay. understand they were from Korea. Sorry about that. I thought the Japanese yeah. nuns came. No, these were yeah, the Japanese nuns have come too. But, yeah, uh, you know, when you mentioned the drums, the first like when I got into my research on Koshki and music in uh -huh. Zen Buddhism or in Buddhism in general, it was when I spent all the time myself in a monastery in Japan, and I came from Germany at that time and. Of course, we chanted the Heart Sutra relatively monotone. But I went there and we every morning we chanted the Heart Sutra with the drums, actually. So we did that every morning. I was like, wow, here's really music. Mm -hmm. And I was a trained jazz saxophone player and it really sounded like jazz, the rhythm. And I was like, wow, this is great here. And I had the same experience as you. It's like so, it, so transformative, this almost shamanic drumming. And like, it just and very high fast speed too. So it's very different from the regular chanting. Yeah, very different. Yeah. Actually, you mentioned also Paula Ally, who's here, I think. Yeah. And she gave a talk for us, I think maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago, oh. I forgot, not so long ago. Mm -hmm. And over dinner, we chatted a little bit and she mentioned she's actually right now creating a new rituals for the community here. I, I'm not sure exactly where, but for, the community, a new Zen ritual. I was wondering, you know, like now you wrote this book and you have so much experience with different ritual traditions. If you're also thinking about creating like new rituals to kind of fill in the gaps of the missing transmission from Japan or from Asia, well, how's your stance to like creating new rituals to fill? I think, um, you know, Paula, <laughs> unlike me, has traveled and researched, and she has a wonderful book on women in ritual in Zen. And um, maybe um, Irene can get the exact titles of those books and put it in the chat while we're here, because she is one of the few people that have, I used her book a lot, and one of the few people who has written about ritual and have, has experienced these rituals and ceremonies in a woman's monastery. Um, again, I um, have written chants myself, but I feel that they aren't coming from that ancient medicine necessarily. Um, where I find myself, I think, creating words with that ancient medicine is creating poetry, Zen poetry, sacred, sacred poetry, because it comes from that silence. And it's a practice that within Zen that um, can be done with a lot of experience too of Zazen. And so that has been my way in the book, The Deepest Peace, uh, was my attempt to bring um, uh, from my experience of life and walking um, on the Zen path to bring the words that came to me in the silence of, uh, of the of the land of the world, you know, um, and I, I studied along with a, a woman, a Zen priest named Ando. Uh, both of us are going to be uh, doing a retreat together called Sacred Poetry, which happens November 12th to the 14th. If you want to get information that's on the website and we're going to start with the Zen masters, uh, Zen poetry and look at the elements of sacred poetry. And so I, I believe that um, I would I would definitely like to, and I have uh, be tutored by <laughs> Paula to you know to not stray away. So some of the the uh, rituals and ceremonies definitely have been tweaked to fit you know um, the sanctuaries, you know the temples, and to fit uh, people who. Um, are just coming in from their ordinary lives, you know, to make it accessible. So a lot of things have changed, um, but I, I feel I'm just not tempted to change, say, the Pira Nirvana uh, uh, ceremony that I was taught. And the Pira Nirvana ceremony is um, in uh, honor of the Buddha's death. And um, I led it for the first time at Green Gulch. I was um, taught by um, Fu Schroeder and uh, and Reb Anderson of how to do that ritual. And um, I remember them us trying to go over, this is how you do it, this is how you do it. 
And I, I was, I don't ever listen with my head or my ears. I just, when they're talking about it, I envision my body moving around the sanctuary, moving about. And so, and then what I'm supposed to do when I move about and who's helping me do that moving. And um, they had talked about it for an hour and they said, are you sure you got it? And I said, yeah, I got it. And I, that comes up, it was pretty quick since it was my first time. And then I went back to my um, cabin and they, and they came to there and they said, are you sure you got it? You wanna come a little earlier and go over it again? And I go, no. And I really knew I didn't have it. <laughs> habit habit in the way that they were asking me. I knew that I didn't, I knew it, but I did see it was like, look, when they talked about it, like moving about a mandala, I could just see it in my, when they were reading it to me. And so I just did that movement, you know, that I saw and felt, and that's from already having done you know, a lot of rituals and ceremonies, you know, at Zen, because when you get to that place, you, you should, be familiar. First of all, you're not going to know. There's no end, no end to knowing the rituals and ceremonies. You just it's just constant, and I think that that's great because you're always being busted open to discover something new. And but there is something basic in all of them, and that is there is a way that you move, and I see that way. I could almost draw it now. If I did anything, I could make art out of the movements in the rituals. I mean, some rituals are done at Green Gulch that are not done in the other centers. So when students come in, they did this entrance that I never seen before. And I was so surprised. I was so taken. And they did it so beautifully, so well. Of course, I cried. I'm just like that. And I'm not a person that cries a lot. People who know me well, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't cry very easily. You know, and not that way, but um, when I saw that them dance and come in and the dance that they did, I would love to draw that in art, you know, how they moved. And um, it, it happened over and over and over again. And every time it happened, no matter how much trouble I had with any of the students or, you know, encounters with anybody, that would just cut it off as soon as they start doing that dance. And they had to do that every time they entered the Zendo after lunch. So I got to see it a lot. And it was very powerful. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have a lot of words to say really, other than it's very powerful. I always feel like I'm repeating myself when I say that. But um, and what does that mean? So I think you have to experience, and you can't just witness it. When people come and witness it, it, it looks really crazy. It doesn't make any sense if you're just going to look at it. But once you engage it enough times, your body will let you know what's happening. Yeah, it's and, very and I'm not